Now joining your downtown Yakima Rotary Club meeting. Underwritten in part by Argus Insurance. Helping you today to secure your tomorrow. And by Treetop. 50 years of growing good. And by the Yakima Herald Republic. A daily part of your life. Welcome to a joint meeting of the Yakima Rotary Club and the Southwest Rotary Club of Yakima. Uh, the president of Southwest is Jill Falk, and we have her here today with us, so welcome all the Southwest Rotarians. And we'll begin our meeting today with music by Linda Kaminsky and Bob Hamilton, God Bless America. One of my favorite parts of the program every week is introducing our guests. Apologize in advance for those names that I foul up, but uh, we'll get it done here. Guest of uh, Kathy Backstrom is uh, Robert Heward. Please stand and we'll give everybody a uh, warm rotary welcome when we're done. Nope, no, 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 no. wait until we're done getting these Southwest Rotarians to Okay, Robert, stay standing, please. Thank you. And Kathy, you can stand with him if you'd like. All right. And a guest of uh, Kaylin Dunn is Sue Dunn. A guest of Doug Rich is Sharon Prill. A guest of Ron King is Paul Mills. A guest of Elaine Barraza is Mary Beth Wright. A guest of Diane Elmas is Pam Schmidt. A guest of Mike Murphy is Rich Robinson. A guest of Jim Berg is Marilyn Fitzgerald, who is our speaker for today. A guest of Gary Trepanier is Mike Stobie. And we have with us uh, the West Valley High School principal, Bill Oppliger. And a, um, my guest today is uh, Betsy Bloomfield. And we have uh, visiting Rotarians Craig Ryan from Bellevue Overlake Club. We have a, a visiting Rotarian of uh, John Vornbrock from Sunrise. And just so we can uh, see all of the Southwest Rotarians, would you all please stand and uh, let's give everybody a warm rotary welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Bill, would you like to uh, come up and tell us about the West Valley uh, Senior Projects that are coming up? And it's Bill Oppliger. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm actually Peter Onsing today, and I learned a long time ago um, when he said, what are you doing on a certain day? It usually meant I was gonna go somewhere for him. And so I'm Peter Onsing today, and I just wanted to talk to you real briefly about um, senior projects and what we do at West Valley High School and also ask for your help. Um, for several years now, West Valley High School students have done their culminating project in the spring. And we do ours in um, March and then one day again in April. And our kids do this and it is the sum total of all the work they've done on their senior projects. And they have to actually do an oral presentation. And their oral presentation is in front of a panel. And so we have approximately 300 students in three or four days that go through and do this and so we're always looking if we can get help from the community to come and actually be observers and participants as panel members and so on each one of your your tables excuse me 
There is an actual sign-up sheet, and it has the dates that we do this, a little bit about what we do, and it's a plea from us, if you can, or if you would be willing to, to come and help support our kids by being a panelist for those days. Um, the kids love it because they have community members there, real people, not their parents or teachers or administrators, and so it really means a lot to uh, have you type of folks there and help support kids and be panelists. So if you would please consider that, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, there are sign-up sheets also, again, as I mentioned, on the table, and there's information there as well. So if you could help support our kids, it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. And we know that you're not Peter Onsing because you do a lot better job than Peter would have done of making that <laughs> announcement. So. <clears throat> All right. Craig, would you like to come up and tell us about the Ski Day and the District Conference? Craig Mendenhall. You know, if this was not a, a joint meeting, I might have said something like, what am I looking at? And you would respond, that's right. That is exactly right. Okay. Can I have all of the downtown members that were introduced during Greg Luring's year stand, those that were introduced last year, and those that have been introduced so far this year? Now, I know most of you have never, most, not all, but most of you have never been to a Rotary Ski Day, and I believe that's because you've never had a personal invitation. So consider this your personal invitation. So what's this about? It's a week from tomorrow. Go ahead and sit down if you'd like. That would be the 25th, and it's, it's really a two-for-oneer, if, if you think about it. It's a sports event, and it's also a social event. In fact, for sports, we're going to have a Sig Fossum, member of this club, owner of Sport House. He'll be up there with demo skis that you can use. It doesn't cost you anything. And then once that's done, if you don't want to ski, you can do cross-country. You can do, I was going to say horseshoes, but I really mean snowshoes. Or bring a book, sit by the fire, and read and have a glass of wine at the club. Then, then we're going to go down to the Rotary Clubhouse, a.k.a. the Schultz Cabin. We'll have prime rib, potatoes, Caesar salad, adult beverages, lots of fellowship. It will be great. Spouses are invited, as well as other significant people in your life. Uh, we know that a lot of people don't want to ski, but they do come directly from work to come up to the cabin. This is a definite carpool thing, so... Uh, anybody that's signed up right now, raise your hands, raise your hands. Those new members, take a look around. You can get a ride with those people. So, it's a week from Friday. It's at the Schultz Cabin. It's a ton of fun, and you should be there. Whew. So now we move. Okay, show of hands. How many people have ever been to a district conference? Geez, there's more people than I would have suspected. Starting last year, we've kind of redubbed the district conference as the road trip. And it's going to be a road trip again this year. It happens to be June, I thought it was June 3rd through the 5th, but I saw on the big board it's the 2nd through the 5th. It's going to be in Ellensburg. We're going to be taking Lady Liberty again for our tailgate function because this is a road trip. And according to District Governor Dave, he's taking... Uh, Jim Berg's advice, there will be no awards during the dinner section of this on Saturday night. They're just going to be fun. And our own Assistant District Governor, Darrell Blue, is in charge of keeping this conference snappy, and we know that he can do that. So there'll be golf, they'll be going to the wind farms, for those that haven't seen that, everyone's favorite, which is home hosting. There will always be great speakers, and you'll see how great they are because our speaker today was a speaker at last year's district conference, so this will be a prelude for you. So again, road trip, June 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th to Ellensburg. It'll be a ton of fun. Carolyn has a block of rooms for all of us. That would be all three clubs. And if you would like one of those rooms, call Carolyn, and she will assign it to you. Thank you. Craig mentioned the Lady Liberty bus that we take up there. Last year's conference in Moses Lake was a lot of fun. It may have been a little too much fun. We did have some guests show up with lights flashing and sirens blaring and uh, threatened to shut us down, but we got through that and the bar was open. So, uh, And I'm sure we'll have just as much fun this year. Um, second of all, 
on the Rotary Ski Day, if there are any members that would like a ride up to the cabin just for dinner, you can call Carolyn and sign up for that. And if there's any members that are going up that could give fellow members rides, please let Carolyn know. And uh, we'd like to arrange that so we can uh, get some people up there that uh, cannot drive themselves. Martin, are you ready for this? Okay, come on up. Martin Strike is going to tell us about the Southwest Rotary Auction coming up. Thank you, and I'm actually I'm here with Roger Calhoun and uh, Jill. I'm going to be dragging you into this this uh, Sora group from the Southwest Rotary. Uh, Roger and I are here today to uh, invite you all to come to uh, uh, the Southwest Rotary uh, dinner and auction, which is taking place on April 9th, Saturday, April 9th, and uh, it's going to be a great time. We have, uh, as you come to expect from the Southwest Rotary, we've got a, a great event lined up. Uh, we have Gasparetti's who are going to be doing uh, the catering. It's going to be real 70s cuisine. Uh, there's going to be a silent auction with all sorts of groovy no novelty items to select from. And uh, Roger, you're going to cover the other items here. Yeah, just to give you some idea of some of the neat auction items we're going to have, there'll be a silent auction. Uh, <laughs> You do. <laughs> Goodwill, three bucks. <laughs> anyway, um, on the aux silent or the uh, live auction, um, excuse me, uh, we're going to have a men's uh, poker party uh, up for auction, a women's day by the pool, an overnight stay and dinner at Sun River, which is kind of cool. A Klickitat River float trip, four nights, and a beautiful chalet on Hunter Bay, a helicopter ride, and we have a condo in Hawaii uh, for bid, plus many other things, including a trip on with a bus up to uh, Mount Rainier and served drinks on the way, if you so desire, and a gourmet dinner when we get there. Thank you. All right, I do have a couple more things. Uh, so and if that were not enough, uh, after the dinner and auction, we are gonna have a, an authentic 70s disco party. So uh, be prepared to come along and dance and all sorts of uh, other surprises to, uh, to make the evening a, a real fun time. Uh, we do have some changes if you've been here, uh, been to our event in the past. Uh, the location is changing. We're gonna be at the Black Box Theater, which is right behind the Capitol Theater, so it's a new venue. Uh, so we'd be thrilled to have you come and join us. Uh, the tickets are only $85 a person, and uh, as everyone in this room knows, uh, the money that's raised goes to all sorts of great uh, community uh, service, uh, service projects uh, and events that uh, really help our community. So we would really appreciate your assistance on that. Uh, that said, I ask that you save the date for April 9th. That's Saturday. The uh, Location is up there. If you want to purchase tickets, get in touch with us at Southwest Rotary. Uh, you can either go to the email address that I have up there or our website. Uh, and with that, I'll thank you again and look forward to seeing you at the uh, Southwest Rotary dinner auction on April 9th. Thank you. Andy Heinz, come on up and tell us about scholarship dinners. Charlie. Um, here just to give a quick pitch for the fireside dinners that are coming up in a couple months. These are the dinners that benefit the academic and vocational scholarships that we give out later in the year. Um, each year dinners are held at club members homes. The idea is just to show up, have a good time, get to know some people better. The way the money is raised is that each club member is billed hundred dollars whether you attend or not, except for hosts. Hosts are exempted. So you have no reason not to go. You'll have a great time and you'll feel more connected to your club. Um, there's no sign-up sheet today. I'm just here to give you notice that the dinners will be held between April 15th and May 15th. Next week there'll be a sign-up sheet. All you need to do is say what days you can either attend a dinner or host a dinner and we'll take care of the rest. So go home and consult your calendars, consult your spouses, see what date works for you and 
be ready to sign up next week. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Andy. And here to give us a classification talk is Sonia Rodriguez True. Sonia? All right, I've dreaded this moment all week, and particularly last night and earlier this morning. Okay, um, I'm Sonia Rodriguez True. Fellow Rotarians, thank you for taking the time to listen to my um, talk about myself and the three minutes is such a short time and that's what I was struggling with is what do you want to hear about me or what do I want you to hear about me in that short amount of time. Um, like many of you, I own my own business. I'm an attorney. I practice for 10 years, eight in private practice. I uh, specialize in family law. I do divorce, custody, child support, paternity. You're not the father. You are the father. No, I'm just kidding. Adoption. Um, that's what I specialize in, a wide range of clients from the poorest of the poor. I've represented foster care children to um, million dollar settlements. And so I have a wide range of experience doing that. Um, the, the other thing I've been doing lately is I'm a pro tem judge in the Yakima County Superior Court. And hopefully I don't look like a deer in the headlights when I'm up there. I, I'm trying to get used to that and I enjoy that experience a lot. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about uh, my family and my community service, that's really important to me. Um, I, of course, most of you know, and especially most of you who are on my Facebook know, that I have a 15-year-old daughter, Raina, and she's a sophomore at Ike, and she's a great kid. She was the youngest member of the varsity uh, soccer team at Ike this year until she fell very, very ill in October and November and December, and we struggled with that, and I, and I really appreciate your support. She's doing a lot better now. In fact, she's on her way to Vegas right now to see some family, so she's doing a lot better this, this month. So that's a trip I wish I could be on, and, and luckily she's, she's doing so well, she's able to fly by herself. Um, <clears throat> I devote uh, many hours, several hours of community service every uh, week. I started an uh, anti-gang neighborhood association group. We meet at YPAL weekly at 6 o'clock. Uh, called the Yakima Gang Free uh, Coalition. Um, and that's part of my passion. You probably found that out when I was served on the Yakima City Council, uh, is solving the gang problem. I feel like I have a lot to contribute to that. Uh, and I only look to my own experience uh, that helps me realize what we need to do. We need to reach out to every single youth uh, and provide them opportunity. One thing I was provided in my youth that made all of the difference in the world is education, and that's why I'm standing here today. But I came from a family with domestic violence, alcoholism, absent father, drug addiction. All of those were present in my family, but education, my mom instilled the idea of education in me, and that is what made me get out of those circumstances and be successful and be the person I am today. And that's the kind of opportunities we need to provide our young kids today. I'm gonna see where I'm at in the three minutes. That's three. <laughs> uh, so, but the one thing I want to close with with the gang problem is that it needs a community-wide commitment. It needs a multifaceted approach. We, I, I, we need all of you to help us with this problem, and I'm hoping that you will um, join me and other community members who are working hard on this issue uh, to help us solve this problem. Thank you. Sonia, thank you very much. And we're glad Raina's doing a lot better, and we wish we could be in Las Vegas with her, so. <laughs> All right. In keeping with our volunteerism, I've uh, asked Betsy Bloomfield to come up here today and talk to us about the Cowichi Canyon Conservancy. Betsy? Thank you, and thanks for help with the PowerPoint presentation. This is a story that is uh, well told in pictures, and there's a cameo appearance of one of your members, and so uh, keep your eye peeled. So thanks again for having me. Uh, Kawichi Canyon was born in the Columbia flood basalt flows 14 million years ago, and it gave us one of Yakima's most important resources, access to premier outdoor recreation right here in our backyard. 
Cowichi Canyon Conservancy is a nonprofit land trust that formed 26 years ago to turn an abandoned rail line into a three mile long nature trail. 20 years later, the Cowichi Canyon Conservancy purchased the 1800 acre Snow Mountain Ranch on Cowichi Mountain and began the vision for the 80 mile long trail connecting Yakima to Mount Rainier. We grew by a couple of orders of magnitude overnight. Now our organization operates the largest nonprofit owned recreation area in the county and does this with no fixed source of public revenue. We depend entirely on donations, grants, and of course, volunteers to manage this stunning recreational area and develop our growing emphasis on youth programs. We're a great place actually to invest your volunteer time and contributions. 96.5%, let me repeat that, 96.5% of our value is invested in our mission, making our 3.5% operations overhead a very, very lean machine. We're doing a huge amount of work with one and one quarter staff people, some extremely dedicated board members, Curtis Sunquist, who is visiting today is currently our president, thank you Curtis, and again, we cannot do this without volunteers. So I'm here today to invite you in this next year to join us as we work to polish up the image of Yakima. Our recreational system should be, really, I need, I need all of us to understand this, we really need to market and operate this as a major capital investment for Yakima, right along with the more traditional ball fields and city parks. Now to get us partway there, we have four major categories for volunteers that we'd love your help with. The July 2010 fire had a major impact on our landscape and we're working to reduce the explosive growth of weeds that happens after fires. We need an army of volunteers to walk across the landscape and dig scotch thistle before it goes to seed. This is a boots on the ground project and it's really critical this year. We already had our first of two planned field days last Saturday and our next day is Saturday, March 12th 9 o'clock to noon, and we meet at Snow Mountain Ranch. Uh, we meet at the parking lot on Cowichi Mill Road. And so bring your shovels, gloves, and water. And so are you seeing who's in the picture? Doug Corcoran, down in the left-hand corner. He was out last Saturday digging weeds. Thank you, Doug. So our next volunteer category is trail building and trailhead facility improvements. You've all probably heard by now the William O. Douglas Trail. Well, we need to take it from vision to action, and to that end, we plan on opening for business the William O. Douglas Trail in June, National Trails Day of 2012, and we're gonna be doing really specific trail and bridge work on certain segments throughout this year. We also need to grade and gravel our parking lot at Snow Mountain Ranch and do extensive cleanup and improvements to our trailhead at the west end of Cowichi Canyon. If any of you have been to that, the Canyon Trail, the upper end has a lot of problems with it that we need to fix and we're gonna need laborers and materials for these trail projects. The third and hottest growing category for us is supervising youth programs. We need adult helpers for school trips to Cowichi Canyon and Snow Mountain Ranch this year. And, sneak preview, Project Butterfly is coming. We have five rare species of butterflies on Snow Mountain Ranch and we're planning a children's butterfly garden project. We need help with planning, materials, garden installation, and outreach. Now we're gonna be putting out calls for volunteers all year this year. You can learn about the projects on our website and we send notices directly to our membership. So becoming, is a great, becoming a member, great way to volunteer and help. Thank you very much. Got it, just under, just over, no worries. All right. Well, you're in for a treat. Uh, our program today is, is wonderful. I've had the pleasure of hearing her twice, and it's, uh, it's a great presentation. So, Jim Berg, please come up and introduce today's speaker. Thank you, President Charlie. Over the course of the Rotary year, um, I think it's important to periodically uh, um, hear about what Rotary is and what Rotarians do, and your program committee feels the same way, and so they periodically uh, arrange programs towards that end, and we have one of those today. Um, our speaker is Dr. Marilyn Fitzgerald. 
Um, she is one of those programs that tells us what it's like to be a Rotarian, a real Rotarian, and I think you will find her uh, presentation very compelling. Um, Dr. Fitzgerald is a PhD uh, psychologist, clinical psychologist. Um, she hails from Traverse City, Michigan. Uh, she's out here um, not just to see us. She's also speaking at the, uh, at the Big Zone uh, uh, Pets Conference in Seattle this weekend. Um, but she is one who has great ties to, uh, to Rotary and to international service. Um, in addition to her clinical psychology practice, she has a business called um, Common Ground Solutions, it, which consults with organizations um, interested in projects intended to achieve sustainable ongoing uh, uh, outcomes. Um, she is a, uh, as I said, she is a uh, Rotarian. She is a former team leader for a group study exchange that went to Bali in Indian, Indonesia. Uh, following her return from that, she uh, felt so compelled uh, about what she saw and observed um, on that trip that she co-authored a, uh, a 3-H grant totaling $475,000 for the purchase of equipment to establish a new blood, uh, blood bank in Bali. And she returned and uh, greatly participated in that. And since then, she has uh, successfully authored numerous uh, uh, international grants through Rotary uh, related to, to projects uh, of a humanitarian uh, uh, nature. She has uh, been in, extensively involved in humanitarian work uh, throughout her adult life in Romania, Indonesia, Nicaragua, and Guatemala. Um, and it's interesting, her, her uh, uh, PhD dissertation was entitled, The Unintended Consequences of Humanitarian Aid. Um, uh, Marilyn presents a, a great example of what it is to be a Rotarian, and I hope that uh, when you hear her presentation, it will nudge each of you to, to look in that direction more than you do now. Please join me in welcoming Marilyn Fitzgerald. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. What a great introduction. I'm so pleased to be here. I would be here. I didn't need to just go to come here to be to, with pets, but I will tell you, Jim Berg was so persistent when I met him at the district conference last year and stayed on this for a whole year that there was no way that I could say no to him. When I said yes, I thought, well, it's a year off. You know, who's going to remember that? Jim Berg. So he got a hold of me, and here we are. And I'm really pleased to be here and really honored that you would have me. What a wonderful club. Uh, when I was first asked to give a a presentation about the Rotary Foundation, I said, there's no way I can do that because I knew people that had given presentations about the Rotary Foundation and I thought, they know all this stuff. They know all about the Bequest Society and what grant does what and what matches what and all the Paul Harris Fellow stuff and I don't know that stuff, so how could I possibly give a foundation speech? Well, it was a past district governor that had asked me to give the speech and said, if you just get up and talk about the group study exchange experience and our district's experience, it'll be a Rotary Foundation speech. So I'm here today to tell you that story. When about, I was in Rotary for about four years before I really understood very much about the Rotary Foundation. I come from a large club of about 300 people, and at that time there were about six women in our club. So you can imagine exactly how welcome we were. They were so excited to have us. Uh, so I heard um, someone got up and made an announcement and said that the Rotary Foundation was going to sponsor this group study exchange team to go to Bali, Indonesia for six weeks. Well, I'm up in northern Michigan, and it's snowing, and I'm, and I'm thinking, Bali, Indonesia, and what are we going to do there? And they said, you're, you're going to just spread goodwill and understanding. You'll be the team leader and take this whole team, and thought, well... I had this great vision, there I'll be, on the beaches of Bali, floating on a raft, thinking about service above self, spreading <laughs> goodwill and understanding while I'm drinking fruit drinks and things like that. What could be wrong with that picture? So it took me about 30 seconds to decide, you know what, I really want to do this. I really want to go do, be the team leader for Bali, Indonesia. So I went through all the things that you go through to make that happen, had the interviews, and it was really quite competitive. And they chose me, and I was so excited, and I was looking at all the brochures for Bali, and they were all the beautiful people in all the beaches, and thought, holy cow, I've done all right here. 
So then it came time to go to Bali. And we worked to get the whole team together. None of the, no one else, for those of you that don't know, on the group study exchange team is a Rotarian. So the leader is a Rotarian, and we're bringing young professionals with us to see their, mirror their occupation in another country and spread goodwill and understanding. So I was really honored to do that. Still thinking, on to the fruit drinks real soon. So we landed in Bali, Indonesia. I could not believe how hot it was. My blood is so thick, like spaghetti sauce. To be living in northern Michigan, it was like March, and it was, when we landed in Bali, it must have been like 100 degrees and 98% humidity, and I started to sweat. I didn't like just like glow, and I didn't just perspire. I was sweating. I was sweating all the time, everywhere. I was just totally wet. The Indonesians were really impressed at how much I could sweat. <laughs> The team was really impressed at how much I could sweat. And you know that whole leadership theory on uh, if, you're, if you're the leader, never let him see you sweat. It wasn't working out that well for me. Nobody wanted to touch me. It felt like I was drenched all the time. If they had been like a fist bump back in those days, they'd have been doing that because people were just staying far away from me. But when you're in the group study exchange team, every week you stay at a different Rotarian's house. So we were constantly moving, and that's the great part about it. Um, you're not really staying in the five-star hotels. You're not really one of the beautiful people because you're so busy sweating. So when we went around with the Rotarians on, on the island of Bali, there's 2.5 million citizens. There are 80 Rotarians on that whole island. The Rotary clubs there are made up of Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, and Christians. But they're very small clubs, so we'd sometimes do presentations in living rooms of the Rotarians. But I was so very impressed with how hard the Rotarians were working, so that they took me around to some different projects that they were working on when the rest of the team was doing their occupational piece of it. And I couldn't believe it. We were going to different villages, and we were going to see leper colonies. We were going to orphanages. Every place we went, we took about 50 pounds of rice and always always left it there. There was always a place for that rice to be. And the, in, in many of the villages, the women would line up and they would want me to hold their babies, their children. Well, I, did, I didn't know why they wanted me to do it, but their children were very different than any children I had ever seen before because their children, many of them were naked, they were infants, they were toddlers, they had bloated bellies because of malnutrition. They had big chunks of hair missing, and some of their hair was red because of malnutrition. And so finally, I said to my counterpart, Freddie Subianto, a group study exchange team leader that came to our district then, why do these moms line up and, and want me to hold their babies? And he said, because when you come to their village and have not seen a woman like you before, when you come into their village, it gives them hope. I said, hope? Hope for what? He said, they don't know. They just assume because you're here, something good will happen just because you were here. Well, all of a sudden, I started to feel this big responsibility about giving hope. I didn't remember anybody ever looking at me with hope before. And I remember those women looking at me with hope. And I would hold their babies for just a couple seconds and then give their babies back to them. And we would go on and on. They'd line up for me to hold their babies. So that, was, that really made me think about the responsibility of giving hope. If you're going to give hope to someone, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do with that feeling? As I thought about that awesome responsibility, I thought about the fact that how much we take for granted in our own country. You know, we take for granted that our children are going to have proper nutrition, and we take for granted that we're, they're going to have immunizations, and they're going to go to school, and they're going to have enough food. And I started to think about, why do we take that for granted? You know, I didn't do anything special to be born here. I didn't do anything good and wonderful to be born in the United States. They didn't do anything evil or bad to be born there. Why do they have to worry about their children? And we don't have to worry about our children when it comes to these kind of things. We've got all kinds of support programs. And then the words came to me that I would remember reading that to much, to those, to much that is given, we have a big responsibility to give back again. But I just didn't know what to do. But I knew that in Indonesia, I knew that on the exchange team, I really wanted to be able to identify a project that I could bring back home again, even though really and truly the only goal they have of you is, is to spread goodwill and understanding. So every day I saw these projects. Every day I was in these villages. Every day I saw hungry children. 
I'd never been exposed to anything like that before, but I kept waiting to see if anyone would talk to me about maybe we could partner for some kind of a project. So finally, one evening, the ambassadors from Germany and from Australia, who were also Rotarians in Bali, asked to have a private meeting with me, and they told me about the Bali Blood Bank. And they told me that at the Bali Blood Bank, people are bleeding to death every day in Indonesia, right there in Bali. And in fact, in the couple days that we had been there, over 100 people died of dengue fever because they didn't have access to proper blood. Or women were hemorrhaging to death because they didn't have access to blood. I couldn't believe that. So then they told me how hard their clubs worked. Those little 80 Rotarians had worked for two years to save $180,000 so that they could then build a Bali blood bank, a new Bali blood bank. And they told me that they sent their own families back home whenever there was any kind of medical emergency. So they said that the deal was that they had raised their $160,000 and I was there right exactly when they were overthrowing the government. So Egypt really rang with me the other day, but they were overthrowing Suharto, who had been a dictator for 30 years. When that happened, the money in the Indonesian banks, the $160,000 that the Rotarians had worked so hard to save for two years, was only worth about 8% of its original value. They lost all their money. They had pre-ordered the construction materials for this blood bank, and they had to come up with the money within 60 days or they'd lose those materials. And the United States was putting sanctions on Indonesia at the time, so there was really not much hope of new materials coming back in. So that was the bad news. The good news was what was going to cost $160,000 for them to build, they now could build for $80,000. <laughs> so here was their question to me. Would your district or would your club help us get the $80,000 to secure that construction material for our new blood bank? And we need to have that happen within 60 days, or it's sold. I was pretty sure I didn't have the authority to commit to $80,000 within 60 days. And really, that was a big question. They asked me for help. The project was there before me. It wasn't my dream project. I just kept thinking about all the mothers and babies and all that kind of thing. But they were asking, and so I thought, well, I was really looking for a little distraction. And I said, you know what, I, I, sure, I'll be glad to take that home and tell our district about it, uh, but I need to go to the blood bank, I need to take some pictures and all that kind of thing. Well, they took me to the blood bank the very next day. It was horrid. It was the worst place. I couldn't believe it. It was only about 600 square feet, and there was no air conditioning. And you know how when we go to some medical clinic and we can smell the alcohol, there's something reassuring about all that antiseptic stuff that's going on. When I went to the Bali Blood Bank, there was no air conditioning, so all the windows were open and there were bugs and mosquitoes and everything everywhere, and there was this overwhelming smell of rotting blood. The reason why is because the refrigerators were broken down and they couldn't keep the blood for more than 48 hours, ever. Even if the refrigerators were not broken down, they couldn't keep the blood longer than that. And the refrigerator door was one of those big glass refrigerator doors, had duct tape holding it together, and they're trying to keep blood at a certain temperature for all of that. It smelled so bad that it reminded me of a slaughterhouse that my parents used to take us to when we were little to get, the, get our meat. We bought a half a cow at a time. We had five children. That's what it reminded me of, is that slaughterhouse, to smell that blood. And I was watching him give some people, they would take their blood and they would give it back to the people that were going to have surgery the next day and hope that they could keep it, that they could find some place to keep it cold so they could have it for the next day. I, I just thought it was unbelievable, but I still was just so nervous to make any kind of a commitment and said, you know what, I'll take, I promise, I'll take these pictures, I'll take them home, and I'll, I'll tell our people about it. Well, we were getting ready to leave the Bali Blood Bank, and there was a, a young girl, looked like she was about 10 years old, and she was with three other villagers, these boys that looked like they were maybe 12 or 13, and they were coming across the parking lot, and I said, what's that about? And they were saying, they were asking her questions and the boys' questions, and the Rotarians were finding out that she'd been diagnosed by the village witch doctor with dengue fever, and that they had heard that it would take three donors of blood in order for her to get some kind of medical cure for this. And so they, she was bringing her blood in on a hoof, and hopefully she was going to get treated for this dengue fever, and she wouldn't be one of the hundred that had just died not that long ago. And I said, well, can we just watch? I, I just want to see the process. And they said, sure. 
So we stood and watched, and I watched them approach the first boy, and they didn't clean anything off on him, you know, like how we get our little area cleaned and everything. They didn't do that. And they took a needle, and they put it in his vein. This little girl was just fascinated with me, just kept like looking at me like I was some kind of a monkey. I'm sure I looked strange to her from the village. They put the needle in the first little boy, and then they took that same needle, and they put it in the second little boy. And they took that same needle, and they put it in the third little boy. And the last person to use that needle was that little girl. And they thought nothing of it. And all I could do at that point was say, OK, we'll help. I don't know what we'll do, but we'll for sure help. We'll be there. So too soon the trip was over, and it was looming in my head thinking, oh my gosh, we've got 60 days to make this happen. And so I came home with a fire in my belly. I was crazed and said, OK, to the World Community Service Committee, we have to have an emergency meeting because you can't believe it. Had a meeting with the World Community Service Committee, standing up, like it was a really informal thing, standing up after one of the meetings. And they all wanted to know how the trip went. And they were all concerned because of the um, overthrow of the government while we were there and all that kind of stuff. And then I told them about the Bali blood bank, that you can't believe it, that people are bleeding to death in Bali, Indonesia right now. And that Rotarians can't even get blood. Nobody can get blood. They're bleeding to death. Women are hemorrhaging to death. Children died of dengue fever right while we were there. And they need a new blood bank. And they lost all their money. But now they can build a new one for $80,000. And so we really need to help them. They asked us for help. And so where would I get that check? They're just stunned. <laughs> they started to tell me, Marilyn, you know, Ron Danielson was a group study exchange leader a few years ago, and he went to England. And when he came back, we had a meeting, and he said thank you to everybody. And he brought back some bone china for the club president and some other people. <laughs> and we send you to Bali, Indonesia, and you need a check for $80,000, like, right now. And you could just kind of see the wheels turning in their head. There was just this big silence, and they were thinking things like, whose idea was it to let women in Rotary anyway? <laughs> <laughs> they were still quiet again. And so then I started to say, you know what? When I joined this club, our club has this great history. When I joined this club, you taught me that when a Rotarian asks for help, there's really only one answer, and that answer is yes. You didn't tell me only Rotarians in this club, only Rotarians in this district, only Rotarians in this country, you said when a Rotarian asks for help, there's really only one answer, and that answer is yes. So Rotarians asked me for help, and I did exactly what you taught me to do and said yes. Again, silence. I thought maybe it was the first time that the men in my club believed I was like a natural blonde. It just kept looking at me. So finally, they decided that maybe this should be a district project. That's it. I should go down 150 miles, go visit the district governor, tell him about the district, about this project, make it a big district project, and then they would be off the hook. I never met a district governor before, but I said, OK, fine. How bad could that be? I did notice I was the only one in the car driving down to see the district governor. But anyway, I thought, maybe, I'm, maybe they know something. I don't know. Maybe I'm going to get excommunicated or something. Who knows? So I went to see the district governor, and he's a wonderful guy. And he listened to the whole story. And he listened, and he just seemed like he had so much compassion. Well, that year, the, the theme for the Rotary International was follow your Rotary dream. I was so naive, I didn't even know we had themes. But anyway, it happened to be follow your Rotary dream that year. And he listened, and he listened to me, and he took off his pin that said follow your Rotary dream. And he pinned that pin on me. I thought that was so cool. It was like getting pinned in college or something. I was so honored. And he said, Marilyn, I think this is a great project. And I think you should follow your rotary dream. So I thought, oh, wow, this is so great. The district governor thinks I should follow my rotary dream. So I was about 10 miles down the road that I thought, hey, I didn't come here. I didn't come here to have a dream. I came here to get $80,000, and I still don't have the money. So I thought, I need to frame this just right for the club back home on what it is that the district governor had to say. And so I told them that the district governor supported our project like crazy. He gave me this very pin. And this pin says, follow your rotary dream. And he wanted us to follow our rotary dream. So here we go. I'll tell you, at that point, the club really did get behind me. That was when I really understood the backbone of rotary fellowship within a club. 
we couldn't, we didn't have time for raffles, we didn't have time for all the kinds of things that you could do for fundraisers, and they decided the best thing we could do is get on the road and tell everybody the story and see how much money we could get. We have a big, long district that goes from northern Michigan all the way up into Wawa, Canada. And so we couldn't hit every club, but we could hit a lot of clubs. And so one person on the committee got busy calling clubs to get us on the program. Another person on the committee got busy doing a PowerPoint for me. And somebody else got on the committee to make sure that we had the transportation to be where we needed to be. And I don't even know how many clubs we did in how many days, but at the end of all of that, every club we went to, they were writing out checks in the audience. People in the audience were writing out checks. Club board, board of directors were meeting, have emergency meetings after the meeting. Every single club we went to gave us money before we left. Before we left, at the end of 45 days, 45 days, we had $80,000. So that was pretty cool. And that came out of the pockets of Rotarians. So they listened to the story. I know why I did what I did. It was long and it was grueling. I did it because I had to do it because I was the one that went to the blood bank. I was the one that met the children. I was the one that smelled the rotting blood. I could not do what I did. But bless the Rotarians that didn't have that experience, that could listen to that story with their heart and could still give us the money and say, OK, I want to be part of that. So then I went around to thank some of the Rotary Clubs in our area to tell them thanks. You know, you can't believe it. We gave them the money in um, late, in September of 1999. By 2000, in January, the new building was built thanks to all the hard work of the Rotarians there in Bali. So I was going around to thank people and give them pictures of the club or of the Bali blood bank, all framed and nice and everything. And I was at this one Petoskey club up in northern Michigan in the district, really crusty old district governor in the audience said, Oh yeah, well that's great. You know, they didn't have a place to be. They didn't have a place for equipment and all that kind of thing. But they still had the same broken down equipment, Marilyn. They still have the same broken refrigerator. They still have all those things going on. So what are you gonna do about that? I, thought, <laughs> I, I was I was stunned. My turn to be stunned. And so I thought, I just wanted to go home and put my feet up and have a glass of wine. But so I was just I said, you know what, Ernie? I don't know what I'm gonna do about that. What are you gonna do about that? Okay, so don't say that to a crusty old district governor, okay? Here's, here's, here's my advice to you, because holy cow, within a week, Ernie had written a discovery grant and was back at my club asking me to sign some paperwork because in a month he was having me back in Bali, Indonesia with a consultant from the Red Cross out of Washington, D.C. I said, Ernie, don't you think it'd be really good time to bring like some other people in the district that might want to go to Bali to go take a look at this whole thing? He said, Marilyn, we don't change ra horses in the middle of a race. I thought, oh, OK, what was I thinking? So back to Bali, Indonesia, with this consultant that could then find out what kind of equipment they needed and what would be the best thing and all that kind of thing. New district governor, new theme. The new theme was something about continuity. That district governor said, I uh, guess what, I mean, what are you going to do this year, Marilyn? And I thought, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. And he said, I always thought it would be cool for our district to have a 3-H grant. How would you like to write a 3-H grant? I didn't know anything about a 3-H grant. So I said, yeah, oh, sure, fine. Got on the website and said, holy cow, these are not that much fun to write, and they're for sure not that easy to get, and there's, they've got like $5 million to give out, and they have a request for about $50 million. And I only want like about a half a million, my own self. And so I thought about it and thought about it and finally wrote the grant. And I'll be darned if we didn't get the 3-H grant for $475,000. So that got us the, um, you know, the, the foundation wouldn't pay for bricks and mortar, so it couldn't help us with the building. But they did come through with all the money for the equipment. And then we wrote a matching grant for a couple blood mobiles so that these people could then get into the villages and help people that didn't have, would not have to walk in at that point. So that was pretty interesting. And I really understood about the backbone of Rotary Fellowship, both on the club level, the district level, and the world level at that point. They were amazing, but I wasn't done yet. I still wanted to stay involved in Indonesia, and so did a lot of people in our club, and people, 17 people had gone to see the blood bank when it was done, so it was an amazing thing. So I heard from Freddie Subianto, who said, Marilyn sent me a copy of the UNICEF report that said the children in Indonesia are in worse poverty straits of any children in all of Asia. Any children in all of Asia. I'd already read that 33,000 people die needlessly every single day. 
every single day. I found out that also 33,000 children in Indonesia need to go to school and can't go to school. So Freddie gave me the number, and the number was kids in Indonesia could go to school for $60 a year. For $60 a year, it would pay for their tuition, their books, their uniforms, a cup of rice a day, and meat twice a week, and a nutritional supplement. $60 a year. I thought, you know what, I didn't, had not only written that one matching grant, and I thought, I wonder if it would work like if I wrote one grant for $1,000, if I got that money from our club, and then I wrote a matching grant, and then that would put, I don't know, 60, 70 kids in school, and then if that worked out good, then we could make that a model for the district and everybody could go. So I went back to the club board, and you can only imagine how happy they were to see me and said, you know what, I want to write out this grant because here's the things that can happen with it. So I just need $1,000. And they said, Marilyn, go in front of the club. Tell the club this whole deal, and what they don't give you will make up in the end. And I said, okay. So I went before the club, and I said, you guys can't believe it. For $60, we can keep a child in school in Indonesia, pay for their books, uniforms, food, pay for a cup of rice a day, might meet twice a week, a nutritional supplement, and some of these kids, that's all the food they get all week. It's an amazing thing. We wouldn't only be having kids in school, we would be having kids also, we could be saving lives of those kids that are dying every single year. I knew I had seen the eyes of some of those children. I knew for sure I looked into the mother's eyes and saw their hope. So I said that to the club. They only gave me like about three minutes to get up and say that. And that day, the club donated $8,000 for this program because I forgot to tell them I only needed $1,000. So, so they were wonderful. So then we were talking a serious matching grant there. So that was great. So then we got, of course, as all projects do that I get involved in, snowballed and snowballed. And before you knew it, I knew there were only 1,200 kids in that village and that if we could just get all 1,200 kids in school for like maybe three years, that would be really good, and we could really feel good about that, because I didn't like going back to the village and seeing kids that couldn't go to school because we were only paying for some of those kids. So that became a district goal, and we really did duplicate that around. But it wasn't so at the end of that time, we had 1,200 kids in school with a commitment of three years. So, it was, so my budget was about $72,000 a year, which I started out only wanting $1,000. So it grew and grew and grew, and so, it wasn't all sunshine and roses. I had plenty of Rotarians come up and say, Marilyn, you know what, you can't save the whole world. And besides that, there were 33,000 kids in Indonesia that need to go to school, and you're only doing 1,200. That's like a drop in the bucket. And I felt really sad about that, and I, I never knew what to say about that. And so I asked one of my Rotarian friends who had been raising money for a long time and said, what do you say like when they say you can't save the whole world? And he said, you know what, Marilyn, you really can't save the whole world. You really can't. I really didn't want to hear that either. But he said, we can light a candle in a dark corner. Light a candle in a dark corner. That'll give hope. And if a person just has a little bit of hope, they can go on for another day. And they can take that next step, that if we just give them some hope. And my friend Wes was right because Rotarians from Japan and Australia came to Bali for their vacations, and they went and looked at our village in Sembug, and they duplicated that program and did it in different villages in Indonesia. So all we did was just like a little glow, just a tiny little candle that we lit. So the three things I learned that were really important to me in Bali, Indonesia, were the responsibility of giving hope to somebody. That is a huge responsibility. I also learned about the backbone of fellowship. The fellowship in my club, the fellowship in my district, and the fellowship in the world. We all really learned a big lesson about what it means when we teach young Rotarians, when a Rotarian asks for help, there's really only one answer. So when we were getting ready for the group study exchange trip, we read all the things we were supposed to read. We read about the water. We read about, of course, we had to stay away from crowds and all that kind of thing because of the civil unrest. We took our malaria medication. We did everything, all the precautions we were supposed to do to take care of our bodies. But nobody told me about my heart. Nobody told me about how to protect my heart from getting broken when I saw things like that. What it would do to my soul and how to try to fence all that in. And that was an important lesson for me, because you can't go unless you're going to take your heart with you 
And when you do, you leave part of it there. And that's an important, important thing to remember. But now, when people say, Marilyn, you can't save the whole world, I give them my Margaret Mead quote that she said, just for me, so that I can say it to you today. And that quote is, never doubt that a few committed, concerned citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Thank you. Marilyn, great presentation. I learned two things today. First of all, be careful who you choose to lead your GSE team. And second of all, that we're very lucky that we live here in Yakima because in this District 5060, we don't have any old, crusty district governors. They're all just great people. So, For you, we have a rotary apple for your presentation. I'd like to thank Jill Falk and all the Southwest Rotarians for being here today. Uh, thank you to everyone that made this meeting happen. And afterwards, we have a committee meeting with Rotary Education with Craig Hooper right over here. And uh, next week, we'll be back here at the Convention Center with Helen Thayer on Walking Africa, two weeks with Sean Cleary, the Iron Man of Radiation Oncology, and three weeks with Rita Goldman Gelman talking about world travels in India. And with that, we're adjourned. Sorry. Great job. This has been a replay of your Yakima Downtown Rotary Club meeting, underwritten in part by Argus, helping you today to secure your tomorrow, and by Treetop, 50 years of growing good, and by the Yakima Herald Republic, a daily part of your life. A community's identity is represented by the values of its citizenry and KYVE is a very effective format for conversation, enlightenment, and understanding. KYVE is the crier, the herald that provides the context for who we are, what we represent, and why we choose to call the Yakima Valley our home. To not be part of KYVE is to ignore the most accessible means to our community that we have available to us in our valley.